Hey guys, couch time with Kim, here we go. This is it. I am so excited, so excited y'all are here. I can't tell because I'm not very tech savvy. I can't really tell who all's here. So if you send in a message, that kind of lets me know I'm not out here all alone. Of course, if I am out here all alone, then um, I don't know that I want to know that either. Um, so yeah, a few people are watching, that's great. Abby, good to see you. Sarah Mutchler, my girl. All right, so <clears throat> I'm gonna go ahead and just jump in um, and start and start. Um, for those of you that know me, you know that uh, marriage is my passion and has been for a while. Hi, Michelle, good to see you. Um, I started the marriage place about five years ago and I wanted to, to put a different message in the world because because I almost lost my marriage. And when I did, hi Linda, um, when I did, there wasn't a lot of really good help for me out there. Hey Alex, y'all, that's my kid. How cool is that, that my college kid is watching from his dorm room? Hi baby boy. Um, and because there wasn't a lot of good help for me, we floundered, we really did flounder and unnecessary pain, I think. Hey, Marcy, good to see you too. Um, one of the things I've always been kind of amazed at is that we put a whole lot more energy and emphasis in getting a driver's license than we do a marriage license. And that just seems kind of crazy to me that we do, you know, we train and prepare more on the other. Um, oh, it's Ed and Carol. Gosh, how are you guys doing? I haven't seen you in forever. Hey, Bex. Um, so... I started thinking back when John and I, you know, when we actually were able to put our marriage back together about how, how we got in that position that we were in. And I really, I'd like to blame it all on society, you know, the message out there of what love ought to look like. Um, but I, and I think it has its share, but I think that, um, I think that I was really confused about what love really is and what it isn't. Hey, Jessica, good to see you. And Rodney, good to see you guys. Um, you know, love is, is a feeling and it's an action. And when you get the two confused, the importance of them, everything's gonna get wonky for you. You know, love as a feeling um, is a great, <clears throat> a high that you can be on that can make everything, you know, you know that feeling of being in love and the, and the, and the excitement and the passion that comes with that. But it's also, it's also a commitment and a choice. But when you hear people say love is a choice, that can sound kind of, you know, um, what am I trying to think of? What's that word? Where it's just uh, too intellectual or too too touchy-feely even maybe to choose love. So what does it look like to choose love? Well, think about um, feelers and choosers. And if you are going to be in a relationship with somebody who makes decisions based on how they feel all the time, that's a pretty dangerous, precarious relationship. Because one minute they're there with you and the next minute they're out. One minute you're there with them and the next minute you're out. But if you're married to somebody or in a relationship with somebody who's a chooser and they choose to love, they're going to be committed to showing up whether they feel it or not. And feelings come and go. So I think that's really an important aspect to this. And I was reading a book, The Seven Levels of Intimacy by Matthew Kelly. I love this book. I highly recommend you guys um, spend some time and read this. I just wish I had written it. I'm kind of mad that I didn't write it. But he says here, I love this quote. Have you ever, have you ever read a book and a quote jumped out at you and it's like, those are the words for everything that I've been feeling and thinking for so long. And I'm just going to read this really quickly. And it says, our modern culture equates intimacy with sex and proclaims that love is a feeling. On both counts, we are being massively deceived. And we shouldn't allow such misguided philosophies to determine the direction of our lives. And here's the great winning quote. Sex is only the shadow of intimacy. 
Feelings are just the aroma of the flower we call love, and flowers are not always in bloom. I mean, to me, that was kind of profound, absolutely profound, and, and it's true. And I have to admit, this is kind of hard, hard to admit, but my husband's a chooser and I'm a feeler. And so the only reason we're still married 28 years after the day we said I do, <laughs> till death do us part, by the way, is because he chooses to love and I was a feeler. I had to learn how to be a chooser. And why is that relevant? And, and here's the message for you guys. It's that in this crazy world, we all want, I truly believe this, I've worked with so many people over the years, and we all want the same vision of one day we're gonna to come to the end of our life and we're gonna to look to our right and there's the person that we've journeyed with all through it. And it's the same person and it's companionship and it's trust and it's loyalty, it's devotion. And the only way you're gonna have that is if you're a chooser. Because if you approach relationships as a feeler, man, you're gonna have a revolving door. And you're gonna to look to your right one day and there's not gonna be anybody, be, anybody there. And if there is somebody there, it's not gonna be somebody that you know all that well because you, you haven't gone through the metamorphosis with them that marriage brings to you. Um, you know you're in a relationship with a feeler if you hear the phrase, I love you, but I'm not in love with you anymore. If you hear that, you know that you're dealing with somebody who's a feeler and not a chooser. And I think that that's, that's kind of the epidemic of our world right now. And I always feel like I need to say this when I am speaking about marriage. I am not talking about abusive relationships. I'm not talking about addictions. I'm not talking about, um, you know, affairs, serial infidelities. I'm not talking about trying to stay in marriages where it's unhealthy or a toxic environment. That is not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about people who wrote a, who, who have this idea that they can't be the best version of themselves with their partner because they don't have the feelings. That's the people that I'm talking to with that particular message. Um, and they're out there. And there's another phrase that kind of drives me crazy, and that is, love is all you need. We all want to be loved unconditionally, and we all want to... Um, and we want to have that fantasy love of this is all, my heart wants what my heart wants. That's pretty dangerous territory, guys. And so I've come up with kind of a, a list of things that actually you do need if you want to have a good, healthy relationship. And that is gratitude, discipline, and respect. And I think Matthew Kelly even listed those out in his book, too. I want to give him credit for that. I'm not sure where I got that. It might have been him. Um... But if you don't have those three things, then you don't really have the basis for what can be a really healthy relationship. And if you'll pay attention to that gratitude, discipline, and respect, those are all choosing words, not feeling words, choosing words. So what's really cool about marrying these choosers or being a chooser is that you get to choose to be happy. You get to choose to have a lifetime of love and devotion. I told you guys in the... I'm going to take a break for a minute. I feel like I'm doing all the talking. Of course, that's it with Facebook Live, isn't it? So I'm doing all the talking. So tell me tell me what you guys think about what you just heard. I mean, I just put a lot out there. So tell me, are you choosers or are you feelers? Are you married? To, maybe you shouldn't tell on that. Maybe you shouldn't tell if your partner's a chooser or a feeler. Hey, Marcy. That's my aunt. And there's my mama. Hello, mama. <clears throat> so Marcy, you're a feeler. Okay. I'm right with you, sister. Feeler. Feeler. Anybody else? Remember what it means to be a feeler. Sarah, I'm a chooser. You really are a chooser. I know you, Sarah. You are a chooser. A feeler is somebody who makes decisions based on how they feel in the moment. And that can lead to impulsive decisions or not. Michelle, definitely a feeler. Hey, Brittany. A chooser is someone who makes decisions based on their beliefs, based on their morals, based on 
Choosers are often able to give up what they want now for what they really want later. Devin, Devin's a feeler. We got some feelers out here. And so I'm just wondering if you're a feeler, or do you find yourself oftentimes feeling discontent or do you find yourself oftentimes, um, you know, being impulsive and regretting it, making decisions you regret? Yeah. I am mostly a chooser, but can be a feeler at times. Good. Well, we want choosers to feel, that's for sure. I'm a chooser, I think, Michelle said. Choosers, lots of choosers too. <laughs> Hollywood's a feeler, yep. Hollywood's definitely got a lot of feelers, yeah. Maybe a little bit of both. Yeah, maybe. Um, kind of just depends, I think, on our expectations about what a relationship should be. And when it doesn't meet our expectations, you know, that feeler can kick in and decide to make some pretty drastic decisions. So let me talk to you guys about um, the one thing. I told you I'd give you one thing. How do we coexist happily? You mean feelers and choosers? How do we coexist happily? That's a great question. Um, it is it is a combination, but I'll, I'll tell you, for me and my husband, um, the feeler had to do a lot of work. The feeler had to do a lot of work. That does not mean the chooser's off the hook. The chooser needs to, sometimes they can take the, in my experience, sometimes they can take the route of, I told you I loved you, why do I need to, you know, why do we, we don't need to get too touchy-feely. I told you I loved you once. If I change my mind, I'll let you know. That's not what I'm talking about. A chooser has to learn how to be relational, and they have to learn how to um, kind of meet you in that feeling space. But the feeler, I mean, they're the ones that are reactive, usually. They're the ones who are kind of losing their stuff. And so I had to do a lot of work on moderating myself uh, learning how to keep my cool. I did tell you guys that <laughs> John, my husband, just posted, I had a lot of work to do too. Yes, you did. Yes, you did. And you still can keep working. <laughs> if you want to do that, I'll keep working too. How about that? Uh, yeah. And so the feeler does have to, good, Jennifer, feeler accepts the reality of fleeting emotions. Yes. Yes, and you have to, you know, you come to the understanding and realization that that's kind of where you're wired to go. What makes it hard work for feelers? Cool, all the feelings. We want what we want. We want this ideal. We want to feel loved and close, and um, we bought the fantasy and the fairy tale. And I often think feelers are, are, are made because maybe what they didn't get. Um, at some point in their lives. And so we, we put a lot of expectations on our spouses, guys. We want them to be everything. We want them to be our best friend. We want them to be our soulmates, which I hate that word, by the way. That's another whole nother series. Um, we want them to be good fathers and good mothers and good uh, financial partners and, you know, help around the house. And so... How do you learn to become a chooser? Devin, that's a great question too. How do you learn to become a chooser? I think I am, I have learned to become a chooser. I still fight with feelings, but I have learned to become a chooser. And I learned that by figuring out what's important to me. What is it that I really want? And it's creating, it's, it's gaining discipline to get there. So if, if you know you really wanna lose 20 pounds, Right? You become a chooser every day that you choose to make decisions that are going to get you to your goal. So every day you decide, is this going to take me closer to what I ultimately want or is it going to get me further away? And that's how you become a chooser. I really view it like a muscle. You build up a muscle. Discipline's hard work. It is hard work. So thanks for that question, Devin. Um, the one thing you can do now to... Help your marriage, no matter where it is. See, here's what happens. John Gottman did some research on this, and um, 
he talks about something called negative sentiment override. And what that is, is when once you start to develop negative feelings for your spouse, I'm trying to think of a good analogy for that, but once it starts, it's like it filters everything about your spouse that you see is filtered through that negative lens. You know, it's basic fig physics. What you focus on is what expands, right? So have you ever seen a car or make of a car or a type of breed of dog or whatever, and then somebody tells you what it is and then you start seeing it everywhere? <laughs> it's kind of like that. It's like, oh, my husband leaves a sock. He's such a slob. He's such a slob. You know what? He's always been a slob. And not only is he a slob at home, you know what? He didn't get a promotion. I bet he's a slob at work. And it just kind of builds on itself. It just keeps building on it. And then it's this heaviness. Marcy says, uh, me all the way. <laughs> me too, me too. And so um, pretty soon we start to develop real contempt for our spouse. And once we get there, people, once you're there, you're in the danger zone. And so it's what makes marriage counseling really hard for a lot of people. If you're coming in there and you're met, your marriage is in a tough place and you go in and you feel like you're working on really, really hard stuff all the time and all the negativity just keeps building. It just kind of sucks the energy and the drive out of you for wanting to um, fix anything or change it. Hi, my dad's there. Hi, dad. Hi, dad. All right, so what's the one thing you can begin to do today? Here's the thing I almost don't want to tell you. Because if I tell you, you're going to go, that is just not, it's not profound enough. It's like, you won't believe me how much a difference it can make, but I promise you that this can make, it is huge shift. If you start today, and I want you to write, start writing down positive things about your spouse. I've sat in front of couples who've told me, well, there's nothing I can put on that list. And I'm like, I don't care if it's that, you know, she didn't burn the macaroni today, or he knows how to tie his shoe. Uh, yeah. Whatever you have to start with, start with something and start building on that list. And then I want you to keep adding to it every day. And at least twice a day, I want you to read it to yourself. Just go over the list and read it. See, one little thing and that can shift your whole marriage. If you don't believe me, try me. Try it. It's free. It's free. It's easy. And it might keep you out of therapy. Um... What else do I have? What else did I promise them? Talking to my team now. Like, help me out here. What else did I promise them? Does anybody have any other questions for me today? Hey, Ashley. Hey, Ashley. Hey, Thomas. That's my other kid. My other... I've got two boys watching this. Hey, Brad. Some of these... People I haven't seen in for a very, very, very long time. Um, let me tell you a little bit more about the Marriage Place then. So we have been uh, five years in now, and we have coaches and counselors that work all over um, the world with you, so you don't have to actually come in to see us. We can work with you over video. And one of our specialties is that... We, um, and Linda said, great advice and read that list to your spouse. Absolutely read that list to your spouse. So, um, Michelle asked, what can you do if your spouse doesn't feel your marriage is in the danger zone because I'm a feeler and he's a chooser? I love that question. I love that question because that was my marriage too. And then when I finally was done and he's like, <laughs> when I finally was done and I said I wanted a divorce, then he acts like he's shocked. When I have been telling him, I've been telling him for years that I was unhappy. And he just, he heard it. He says he heard it. I don't know, I'd like to get almost, I'm almost tempted to pull him right here in front of the camera and find out why he didn't listen more. Um, but that would be terrible of me. That would not be a good wife thing to do. Um, so, what do you do? You raise the stakes really high if you have to. You get his attention before you are really done. I want, raise the red flag, go to counseling by yourself if you have to. 
If he won't go with you or she won't go with you, go by yourself. And um, don't be afraid. I mean, everybody gets to this place where they're like, I feel this, and you start to weigh down with the negativity of it, and you start to um, not want to share and open up with him about anything, and then pretty soon you will detach emotionally and be done. And so before you get to that place, you can sit down with him and you're like, hey, we have a problem and I'm a feeler and I'm not feeling it. And so I need to work on that. And maybe it's working on yourself and your expectations, but I've never worked with a couple where it was all one and not some of both that needed to be looked at. So I hope that answered your questions. You know, this is really hard. People, I wondered often why people don't do more of this live stuff. Cause it is scary. Shooting from the hip. I'm so afraid something bad is gonna come out of my mouth. Really bad. How wet? Yeah, pull it up for me so we can talk about that. Janet, you going live was a great idea. Thank you. I'm hoping it was a good idea. Are y'all bored? Is this boring? <laughs> Oh, okay, cool. Cool, cool, cool. Lots of, there are lots of people on here. That's intimidating. Doing great, thank you for this time. You're so welcome. Do you guys wanna see this more often? How often would you like to see couch time? Like will it be more often? Do you like, you know, once a month, once a week? And what I'd like to see are questions of what would you, what kind of topics would you like in the future? Like one thing I thought of today that would be interesting for next week are the three things you could do to keep you out of the therapist office. I've come up with, well, I haven't actually, another therapist out there. Oh, our new belief statement that says, we are here to help people have realistic expectations about love and marriage, and guess what? It starts with you. It starts with you, that's right. Marriage counseling goes much better and easier if I can get two people on the couch willing to work on themselves. What tends to happen though is you come in and you want us to fix your spouse. And it's like if you're living with them and you've been harping on them and angry with them and you can't fix them, the therapist across from them isn't gonna be fixing them either. Um, it would be fun to see your hubby's answers. It would, wouldn't it? Why would we want to stay out of therapy? That's a great question, Marcy. I'd like you to stay out of crisis. How about that? Stay out of crisis. I can give you three things that'll keep you out of crisis, but you're right, come to therapy. Once a week, everybody's saying once a week. Twice a month. Cool, hey Kathy, once a week, couch time. Different topics, send us messages. What would you like to see? You want to talk about sex? You want to talk about um, desire differences? Most marriages, there's a higher desire spouse or a lower desire spouse. Um, parenting, in-laws, what do you want to talk about? I'll go ahead and send that through. Okay, so guys, I think this is about it for tonight. I was just, I really kind of wanted to try this out to see if I'd like it. Um, I think I like it, and so I'm sure we'll be doing this again. Um, if you want to, we try to do it, give you a lot of um, free, really good advice and tips on our website, so feel free to go there and spend some time. How do you move past multiple affairs? Oh dear, that's a tough one. We could, yeah, we could do a whole month of sessions on how to move past multiple affairs. So this is Ray Shauna. Let me just say this, probably the, not most, in fact, most marriages actually do survive an affair. So I, I hope that that helps you um, or someone you know who's going through this. And It starts with a couple of things, but the first one is the desire to want to get past it. The desire to want to get past it. And it, But if I've got somebody, I want to know why we're having multiple affairs. I want to know if there's a sex addiction thing happening there, a love addiction thing. Um, because if that person's not trustworthy, I don't know that I want you to get past multiple affairs. So that's how I feel about that. 
Can you address how to get your wife to come to therapy when she's not interested? That's a tough one. Kind of like um, you can make someone, you know, you can choose to love someone, but you can't choose whether or not they love you. Um, you can choose whether or not you go to therapy, but you can't choose whether or not your spouse goes to therapy. I don't know that you can get your wife to come to therapy, but you can ask. And I think you need to be really clear in your ask about why it's important to you. And if your spouse doesn't go, I'd go anyway. Yeah, and my husband just whispered off to the side, and when they see you change, then they'll wanna come maybe. And maybe, maybe. I'm looking for any more questions. Hi, Ms. Pest. There's great topics in here. If people want to email them, send us anonymous or message us. Yeah, if you guys want to send um, anonymous tips or whatever. Or questions. And we'll put together some sort of calendar. Uh huh. So that everybody here doesn't see who you are, then, hey, Michelle, wow, how are you? Um, you can just send an email to office at themarriageplace.com. And we'll be happy to or message us on Facebook. Message us on Facebook. Yeah, message us on Facebook, and then no one else can see your comment. Um, how do you maintain a healthy and fun marriage when you're exhausted from running the house and the kids? Oh my gosh, that's that's a tough one. How do you maintain a healthy and fun marriage? Um, whew, that's the problem with these shooting live from the hip. I have to think. Um, first thing as I'd give myself a lot of grace to be exhausted and to be split into many places at one time. The second thing that I would say, you know, it's putting this expectation on yourself to do everything really per perfectly, um, is what's going to be exhausting. Add to your exhaustion. Um, priorities determine focus. Priorities determine focus. It, uh, the problem is kids are our priority too, but your marriage has to take priority. Because let me tell you something, what happened to me this last two weeks ago, I took my second baby to college and we are empty nesting for the first time. And you do not want to get to that place in your life and look over next to you and wonder who the heck that person is sitting next to you. So you've got to start now, keep your marriage a priority. Um, Alex, this is my kid. How do you rediscover your spouse after you send the kids off to college? So the mom in me wants to really embarrass you and say a lot of hot sex. Alex, that's what you do when your <laughs> kids go to college. Um, Marcy said get a sitter ASAP. Yeah, get a sitter. Invest in that. Um, Alex, gotcha. Yeah. So uh, let's see what else. Questions. Did I, did I get everything? I feel like I'm kind of rambling now. Date your spouse, date night. Absolutely. One of the things that works is, um, I had a friend tell me this advice years and years ago, and she said she and her husband, they set up a babysitter to come to their house at the same time, the same night of the week, every week, so they didn't have to make it they didn't have to put forth the effort to make it happen. The, mo the momentum was already there. So they, their babysitter knew every Friday at 7 o'clock she showed up at their house. And so that helped them have, even if they just went to Walmart or Christmas shopped or went to Starbucks or whatever. And I think that's a great, great way to handle that. Okay, guys, we've been on here almost 30 minutes, so it's time to wrap it up. Um... Yeah, this was fun, and it was good to see all of you guys here. Um, please send in your comments and your questions. Uh, feel free to reach out to us, read the blog post, connect on Facebook. We're here, and you'll be seeing and hearing more from us. So I'm going to sign off now, if I can figure out how. <laughs>